Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad we to improved here. our couches from I last time you were here because uh, you complained and we took it seriously. So, uh, uh, good to have you. Listen, it was I hear one of those that couches where you simply couldn't. You get remember it well. I it do. was memorable. I do. Um, it was memorable. Let, let, let's this is great, by the way. I love this couch. <laughs> thank you. Let's, so let's get to serious stuff. I hear a rumor. I don't know if it's true. Uh, that Vladimir Putin and Sergei Lavrov are huddled around a screen right now uh, in one corner of the world watching us, and I hear Lindsey Graham and John McCain are near another. And so I'd like to ask you, what would you like to communicate uh, to the world and to those parties about Syria that they may not have heard? There's absolutely no way possible to communicate with those four people in the room. <laughs> uh, Okay, how about for I'll, our, our I'll, crowd here? I'll take on a lot of yeah. challenges, but yeah. uh, uh, Syria uh, is as complicated as any thing I've ever seen in public life in the sense that there are probably about six wars or so going on at the same time, Kurd against Kurd, Kurd against Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, Sunni, Shia, everybody against ISIL, people against Assad, Nusra. This is as mixed up sectarian and uh, civil war and strategic and proxies. So it's, it's very, very difficult to be able to align forces. Uh, so, so in the speak. middle of that, why did you think you could get a ceasefire? Well, we did. We got one for a mm. period of time. Uh, we got one that held for a number of weeks mm -hmm. uh, originally. And then this one uh, was interrupted by two very tragic, uh, different kinds of events. One was a mistake, the other uh, was the destruction of 18 UN humanitarian trucks, uh, which is hard under any circumstances to find a rationale or an excuse uh, for it. And I mean, you now no believe, as I understand it, that that was a purposeful action by... Well, I, I think there's strong evidence with respect to Syrian regime engagement in the beginning of it and Russian involvement. But look, the point is that uh, there's just huge levels of mistrust on either side. But you asked me the question, what right. makes me think? Uh, I make no apology, nor does President Obama, none whatsoever for trying to reach out and find out if there is a way to achieve the political settlement that everybody says is the only way to solve the problem of Syria. You'll find most people constantly saying there is no military solution. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's no military solution, what is the political solution and how do you get there? And who's going to get you there? Well, it's the job of the Secretary of State and it's the job of diplomats to try to do that, as tough as it may be, and it is tough. So, uh, do you think diplomacy has become a dirty word? No, nah, with respect to Syria, to some degree, it's been marred by these uh, breaches of, of the ceasefire and by the destruction and by Russia's persistent support of Assad in a way that is beyond uh, the seeking of a political settlement, if you will. And I think that the bombing of Aleppo right now is inexcusable. It's beyond any, uh, beyond the pale of any notion of uh, strategic or otherwise. It's, 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 it's indiscriminate. It is, they took out a hospital last night. Uh, I think 400 civilians have been killed in the last eight days. A hundred of them are children. Uh, and uh, we've made it crystal clear to them that under those kinds of circumstances, it is not possible to be uh, cooperating and we need to see a change. So are we on the verge of, of taking down the scaffolding and walking away from any chance of going back to your plan of a joint implementation center and a deal with the Russians on, on how to deal with, or, or are you willing to give it another chance? No, I think we're on the verge of suspending the discussion because uh, you, you know, it's, it's irrational in the context of the kind of bombing taking place. Uh, to be sitting there trying to take things seriously. Uh, there's no notion or indication of the seriousness of purpose uh, with what is taking place right now. So uh, it's one of those, you know, moments where we're going to have to uh, pursue other alternatives for a period of time, barring 
some clearer indication by the warring parties mm. uh, that they're prepared to consider how to approach this more effectively. Senators Lindsey uh, Graham and John McCain have kind of lampooned you with threatening the suspension of talks and saying, you know, how, how can this have any influence on the Russians? I, I just love, because I, I, you and I have talked about this before, that, that um, I, I'd like to understand how you, if you're putting yourself, as a diplomat does, in the heads and intentions of Russia, how, how do they see the map and their future, and what are you trying to influence? And if we do walk away, then what influence do we have with the Russians? Well, I'm not worried about, about lampooning, particularly from people who, who don't seem to have uh, the votes or the ability to be able to cobble together a legitimate plan or a legitimate mm -hmm. approach. Uh, I don't see Congress panting to put people on the ground to go to war in Syria. Mm. I don't see people, uh, you know, it's easy to be critical of diplomatic effort because it's difficult, but what is the alternative? Is the United States of America going to go to war in Syria? I, I don't think that's about to happen. We are at war against ISIL, and we are going to win that war. I have no doubt about that, and we are making enormous progress. But that is different and distinct from involving ourselves directly into the civil war, which is the war against Assad. And the Russian point of view, they look at it and they see Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra growing stronger. Jabhat al-Nusra is al-Qaeda. Mm. And Jabhat al-Nusra al-Qaeda is plotting against the United States of America. They are a designated terrorist organization. Mm. And we are prepared to go after them, but Russia doesn't believe that. Because months ago, there was a, an, a, a statement about our beginning to separate some of our fighters from them because they mm. are marbleized as the saying has come to be. Mm. And so there's a huge distrust by Russia that we're actually serious about going after Nusra. They think we're using Nusra in order to go after Assad. So there's huge distrust on both sides here. And uh, the levels of mistrust because of the type of operations that the Russians have chosen to engage in is huge and appropriate on our side, mm. incidentally. Uh, it is inappropriate to be bombing the way they are. It is completely against the laws of war. It is against decency. It's against any common morality. Uh, and it is costing enormously. Mm -hmm. So that is why we're going to have to, you know, why we are pulling back uh, from this concept of, of mm -hmm. so there's no, no miscalculation in anybody's mind about us cooperating in a way that is empowering them to do right. what they're doing. We're just not going to go there. We're not, we're not going to do that, obviously. As much as I don't want to leave the serious <laughs> subject of Syria and, and uh, ISIL and Iraq, um, I want to ask you a bigger question. My colleague Jeffrey Goldberg wrote probably one of the most important articles in foreign policy on the Obama doctrine, one of our cover stories. And I thought it was useful because it began to sort of raise this question of what is someone's frame and filter, their dashboard, their priorities. And I'm really interested in what John Kerry's frame. When you look at a problem out there, I'm interested in what uh, you see as, as, a, as the nation's leading diplomat, as a uh, man who may have been President of the United States. How do you organize in your mind taking on one of these big uh, national security challenges? Well, the, I mean, the first thing you need to do is obviously understand and define the interests of the United States of America. Mm. And our job, my job, president's job, is to protect our nation and to advance our interests and our values simultaneously. Mm. That's really what foreign policy is. I mean, foreign policy is a combination of interests, uh, values. Hopefully, they're melded like that, but not always. Sometimes mm. interests are far greater importance to a particular uh, moment, and you may have tension with the values because of the level of the interest, or the values may be, I mean, the Holocaust or Rwanda or, you know, which is also relevant to the debate about Syria, by the way, uh, is the killings and the torture and the barrel bombs and so the gas. So you put and, you know. Syria in the values category more well, than both. the interest no, category? No, no, it's, it's in both. We have both. Mm. We have huge interest because of the stability of the region, mm -hmm. because of the need to fight against extremism, uh, the need to prevent the country from breaking up, 
uh, and uh, having a negative impact on all of the neighborhood, including our ally Israel and Jordan and Egypt, so forth. So there are a lot of interests there, but there are also values, obviously. Um, and and I'm, I, what I'm just trying to say is you have to get a sense of the import of all so of that. So what's the John Kerry secret sauce in that? If it, you well, know, you every, have to figure out a lot once, of people can say what you just once said. Once you've figured out those things, then you have to figure out whether you can find in the adversaries a meeting of the minds on any of the interests or, and or values. And that mixes differently with different people at different times. With Iran, obviously, and negotiating the Iran nuclear agreement, Iran wanted out from the sanctions. Iran wanted to, uh, you know, didn't think it was worth uh, w the cost they were paying to, uh, to uh, pursue a nuclear weapon. And I think the Ayatollah made it clear that he was going to outlaw it, not go after it. He made a calculated decision. I think the, the right decision, an important decision. And so there was something to work with. But at the same time, there was a huge level of mistrust, a huge level of questioning about sort of where they might go at some future point in time. So we had huge interest in making sure the verification was as strict as possible, that we were able to answer people's questions about the technology and the capacities. And ultimately, you could see a way to get from here to there. That's mm -hmm. what you have to decide. You have to figure out. There are some frozen conflicts in the world today, right. Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, where you can't quite see that right now because mm. the leaders aren't ready, because the tensions aren't right. there. There are some where I think uh, they're difficult, but you can see how you could get there if people made a certain set of decisions. Mm. I believe Israel-Palestine falls into that category. Right. But you have to have people prepared to make a certain set of decisions. Uh, Is the Iran deal what you're most proud of during your tenure? I don't, I really haven't stopped to sort of start to, you know, create a So what are, you, what are you least satisfied with during your tenure? I, I'm not happy with Syria. I'm yeah. very, very dissatisfied with where we are in Syria. I, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about uh, where it is going and what will happen to the people of Syria and to the region uh, if more rational uh, and, and uh, moral-based, common-sense approach is not found to deal with the situation. Uh, Yemen, Libya, I mean, there are challenges, uh, many challenges that are extremely difficult right now. I feel good about where we are moving with ISIL. I think we could move faster to some degree, but I think the president has really gotten us on a track where you can see where we're going in Iraq, you can see where we're heading in Syria, uh, and he's constantly looking for ways to try to accelerate that. Uh, I think the climate change agreement that we reached in Paris is a monumentally, uh, monumental agreement, extraordinarily important uh, because of the threat of climate change, which we're mm -hmm. seeing manifest itself on a global basis uh, everywhere. Uh, and to have brought 185, 86 nations together to reach mm -hmm. agreement, which really largely grew out of the effort we made with China mm -hmm. when we got China to agree to work with us rather than against us, which Our is what had yeah. happened in Copenhagen. Right. That was a sea change. And that resulted in sending a signal to the marketplace in Paris, which we're now following up on with the aviation agreement, with the hydrofluorocarbon agreement, which we hope to get in Kigali in, the, in, in October. And that alone, just getting the hydrofluorocarbons could save one half degree centigrade of rise of temperature on the planet. So these are critical uh, issues. So, I think getting chemical weapons out of right. Syria. So you're, you're laying out the net, net positives, the net gains in the, in the foreign policy roster. And I think you probably talk to more world leaders and foreign ministers than, than, than any person alive right now, say, per day. I mean, you've got probably the largest quotient. How are they seeing American engagement in the world today? Are they seeing us robust and out there? Because there's, there's, a, there's a sense that the world doubts America's staying power in the world. Well, I hear this, but it's really interesting. I, I hear this, and I hear mm -hmm. people allege that the United States is retrenching and that we're somehow pulling back or, you know, but I have to tell you, Steve, mm. I, <laughs> I 
think if you measure all, all of American history, there has never been a moment where the United States is more engaged in more places mm -hmm. simultaneously on as significant a number of complicated issues as we are today and with impact. On Ebola, predictions were a year ago a million people were going to die. President Obama had the courage to send 3,000 troops there. We built healthcare delivery capacity. We galvanized support from around the world. We mm. led that effort. Mm. And that never happened. We never lost a million people. Ebola didn't right. become the global right. scourge. AIDS, we're in the front, you know, we're about to have the first generation of children born in Africa free of AIDS. And we have put an unprecedented amount of money on the table and expertise to deal with that. Afghanistan, we've held Afghanistan together with a unity government after a failed election where it could have collapsed. We've been able to nurture that. It's complicated, difficult, but we've been able to sustain the effort in Afghanistan. Uh, in the South China Sea, we've been able to make it clear freedom of navigation. We've been able to deal with China. We've held that from becoming a major conflict. Uh, Ukraine, the sanctions worked. We are working on the Minsk application and implementation right now, even as we sit here. We've been making progress. I hope we can uh, further that. On Yemen, we've put a peace proposal forward. Uh, the parties are talking about it. We're on the verge, maybe, of a ceasefire there. Libya, we've been able to build the GNA, the, the Government of National Accord. We're working with the Egyptians, with the Emiratis. We're able to try to grow the capacity, the sustainability of that government. It's very tricky. It's tribal. It's complicated. There are uh, extremists there. There is Daesh in some places. We've been able to limit the Daesh presence with a very aggressive effort. Boko Haram in Nigeria, we're pushing them back. We're working right. with Buhari. Al-Shabaab in Somalia, we're pushing them back. We've got a major planned offensive to really sort of, I hope, terminate the Al-Shabaab challenge in Somalia. So maybe we need a bumper I mean, sticker or something like, there's a lot going on, more going on than you think. I mean, I, You know, it, it's not like a marketing problem, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so. I like that. It is a marketing problem. <laughs> You call but, your, but your, your, your folks. We, we've we got are, a couple uh, of minutes, and, and I know you've got some hard stops, and I know you're going to Israel uh, for Shimon Perez's uh, funeral, and we'll yes. work on that. Uh, but in the next minute and a half, I'm, I'm going to combine two things. One, I, I'd like to know, just real quickly, what do you think about Iran today? Is Iran becoming more comfortable for us, or does it still remain in the very, very uncomfortable, despicable category? And I'm going to tack on my last question is, Vietnam is such an important frame for you. I'd like to know what lessons you think we're forgetting from Vietnam uh, in your role that you think that you're worried about. So I'm going to ask you to do those two things as we've got to wrap up. Wow. Two small little. <laughs> David Bradley, our chairman, says you should never combine two big questions, but I'm doing it. Well, Iran, Iran is complicated. We just had a meeting in New York of the Joint Commission. Uh, the Iran agreement is holding. They are living up to their requirements in the mm. Iran agreement. Uh, it is uh, measurable and accountable, transparent. Uh, the IEA knows what's happening. We know what's happening. And we are comfortable that Iran is meeting the agreements it met. They think we are not meeting our part of the agreement. Mm. And they're upset at us that more banking hasn't, uh, more banks, large banks. Are we meeting our part of the agreement? We are. We've oh. done everything and more. Mm. We've not only met our part of the agreement in terms of lifting all the sanctions we said we would lift, but we've personally engaged, I've engaged, and others with banks. We've tried to help because we think it's important that we live up to our side of the bargain and that Iran get the benefits that they bargained for. Right. Otherwise, there's not a lot of incentive for them to continue to live mm. by it, so it's important. There are tensions in Iran. Mm. There is a battle in Iran, in a sense, for its own direction. Mm. That's an internal struggle within the country. Uh, and uh, President Rouhani, I think, has tried very hard to try to, you know, reach out to the world, but there are forces there uh, that pull back on that, and so it's, it's, it will remain complicated, and it just is complicated. So your successor is going to have a fun time with that? Well, I hope it's not, I mean, I hope it's not a, a, a time-consuming, tense time. Mm. It will always be challenging. There are things that Iran is doing in the region that right. we obviously object to. We don't like the support for the Houthis. We don't like the support for Hezbollah, the support mm -hmm. for Assad. 
some of their engagement in other countries, meddling. Obviously, those are things, the missiles, right. uh, the, the, the concerns about human rights and terrorism, those remain. And we left all of those, in fact, intact in the sanctions regime that we have mm. uh, because we really were negotiating the nuclear peace. And the reason for separating was we knew that if we put those things on the table, right. we'd still be there at the table and we wouldn't probably get and, anywhere. And finally, so. quickly, um, I'm, I'm really interested yeah. on Vietnam in the frame. And, and, and because well, it's Vietnam, been so much a part of what you have framed, I'm interested at this, this point when you know, you've done so much in the diplomatic area. What, what are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? And if you can do it in 30 seconds, you'll make everybody real happy. Uh, I never thought I'd do Vietnam in 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> can't do it in 30 seconds, yeah. but it's, it's, I think what's happening in Vietnam is exciting. Hmm. It's incredible. Nobody would have imagined years ago that Vietnam, the quote, communist country, the country that we went to fight to stop from being communist, it's not communist. Hmm. It's authoritarian. It's a one-party authoritarian government, but it's raging capitalism. Hmm. And it is moving so rapidly into the marketplace, it's one of the fastest growing countries in terms of transition, transformation. When I first went there in 1990, there were no cars. People were in black uh, pajamas still. Hmm. They were mostly on bicycles. The traffic lights didn't work in Hanoi. It was, un it was just 50 hmm. years ago. Then, now, skyscrapers everywhere, traffic, uh, people wearing blue jeans and Western clothes and yearning for engagement with the world, fast, fast growing, changing lifestyle, middle class, investment opportunities, and, and it's changed and changing rapidly. There are allowed labor unions, you could strike, uh, that's part of uh, actually- So that should be our lesson then. So the lesson that. is that, that transformation comes through diplomacy. Hmm. We went there and fought a war to prevent them from being something, and in fact, it's only the aftermath of the war and the diplomacy, the opening up, the lifting of the embargo, which by the way, John McCain was a partner with hmm. me in the effort to do that and to help change Vietnam, and Vietnam has changed, and is changing, and we announced when I went there last uh, a few months ago, the opening of a Fulbright University mm. in Hanoi, in Saigon, excuse me, in, in, in Ho Chi Minh City, mm. that will be completely academically free, mm. total independence, able to teach, and the Fulbright program has been one of the real mm. transitional uh, uh, vehicles, if you will, catalysts in Vietnam. Uh, many of the top leaders in the, in, the, in, the, in the highest echelons of leadership of Vietnam have been part of the Fulbright program, and they've studied either at Harvard or somewhere and come over here, and Harvard's gone over there. It's been an incredible transformation. And the lesson is that, uh, uh, you know, it really underscores knowing why if you're gonna to go to war, you're going to war and getting it right, and then afterwards also getting it right. And I think we did one part of it wrong, the other part we've gotten it right, and I'm very proud of that. So on that, Mr. Secretary, thank you. I hear President Obama is holding a plane for you. So, <laughs> so. thank you very much. Thank you.